If you know me well enough, you know that I lack what is commonly known as a life. To me, a life is a video game term, and my favorite video game of all time happens to be Pokemon. Which Pokemon specifically? Well, Generation 2 set of Pokemon games. Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. To me, the aesthetic, charm, love, and care put into this game beats out all other experiences. It might be a bit of nostalgia, but you can't call me a Gen 1-er because it's technically Gen 2, so let me have this boomer take, okay? It's all, it's all I have. Regardless, the history of how these games came to be, the success, and ultimately the gameplay is peak Pokemon for me, and I'm going to go through each and every reason why. Let's take a look back at Generation 2 of Pokemon. Interestingly enough, Pokemon Gold and Silver had a very lengthy and complicated development cycle. Pokemon had become larger than life, and this was to be the direct sequel to the first ever Pokemon games. There was a lot of hype, a lot of expectation, and I imagine it felt quite daunting for the people behind the game. Pressure there with all, Pokemon had honestly grown to be bigger than the game itself. The producer of the games, Tsunekazu Ishihara, even originally planned for this to be Game Freak's final Pokemon game, as the company sought to invest way more time and effort into a more lucrative Pokemon trading card market. They wanted this to be the final greatest Pokemon game. Pokemon was a shift in pop culture unlike anything before it, and people weren't just playing the games anymore, they were watching the anime, they were reading the manga, collecting the toys, collecting the cards. I had Pokemon curtains in my bedroom. There were probably Pokemon condoms. Pokemon was larger than life. And this was the sequel. Pokemon 2, if you will. It's like releasing a sequel to a wheel. They say you can't reinvent the wheel, maybe that's why Pokemon hasn't changed much in 25 years. Zinger. <laughs> that would get so many likes on Twitter. Pokemon Gold and Silver, otherwise known as Pocket Monsters 2 Gold and Silver at the time, was announced at Nintendo Space World 1997, an annual video game trade show Nintendo used to host throughout the 90s. It was a pretty big deal. <laughs> At the time, Nintendo would slate Pokemon Gold and Silver to come out that following March in 1998, but as you'll quickly learn, that didn't go over so well. The game had the launch date postponed, revealed in an apology letter from Nintendo that stated the developers were completely overworked, worn out, and exhausted working on the game. Interestingly though, this Space World build of Pokemon Gold and Silver has been fully released since then, and it is fairly different from the game's final released state. The starters were pretty different, for example, and the game looked a lot more more like the Generation 1 games in terms of color and even sprite design. There was still Chikorita, but instead of Cyndaquil you had Hono Oguma, and instead of Totodile you had Kurusu. In fact, a lot and I mean a lot of Pokemon and sprites from this Space World demo didn't make it to the final game. After a ROM build of the game leaked much, much later in 2018, fans around the world were honestly feeling pretty miffed at all of the Pokemon that ended up being cut from this. And I'm with them, honestly. Some of these were rad as hell. Different starter lines, Hoot Hoot with a different evolution, Mareep is pink and black, who the heck is Mikon? I don't know, looks cute. Monja and Jaranra are seemingly expansions on Tangela. Hanei, a flying fish, Quill Fish has an evolution, weird that he didn't end up with one in the final version of the game, to be honest. Pichu is a cursed being from the depths of hell, Quagsire is Chonky, Gyopin, Maridu, Manbon, Ikari, they're all cool as hell. Ikari, as well as Gurotasu, looks like what would eventually become Sharpedo and Huntail in Gen 3, so at least some of these concepts didn't get fully scrapped to time. The list goes on, but some of my favorites I haven't mentioned are Konya, a sort of baby meowth creature, Haneko, a much cuter hopip, and this version of Ak artillery called Okutan. We could go over these for a while, but it's pretty interesting to just go through the list and see what stuck and what didn't. Some decisions for the better, and some leaving us a little sad, wishing we weren't bereft of some of these cool, unique designs. You'd think that a lot of this new Space World demo stuff would end there, like, oh, okay, a bunch of new designs, but that's not it, actually. There were a ton of features in this demo that ended up getting completely scrapped in the final game. For example, uh, shiny Pokemon had completely different stats, a ton of scrapped areas on a Japan-like map of 
of Johto, as well as five complete mini games Picross, Poker, a memory game, a slide puzzle, and a little hidden mini game on the title screen you can play with Pikachu and Jigglypuff. It's kind of wild that the developers went through the effort to make all these mini games and then they went nowhere. I mean, I'm kind of a sucker for Picross, but I think I'm one of the only three people left in the world who could be caught playing it. The Space World demo was ultimately just a demo, though, and a lot of areas were completely inaccessible, but it's still really cool to look back at. It's this weird transition from Generation 1 to Generation 2, and it's sort of fun to witness today. So, the developers would keep churning away at gold and silver following the huge amount of hype generated from Space World 1997's most popular exhibit. And about two years later, Pokemon Gold and Silver would finally release on November 21st, 1999 in Japan. And boy, was it rad. It was a whole new world with a ton of new features too. Generation 1 is regarded as a bit of a mess. It's riddled with bugs, it's clunky and weird. Pokemon was still getting its footing. It's okay that Wigglytuff Sprite looked like it was going to skin me alive and suck the skin and flesh off of my bones. It was Pokemon's first game. No one knew it was going to be this big. So in this new sequel, they improved on a lot of those flaws. The battles felt sharper and had more depth. Stats were fleshed out. There were new types like Dark and Steel, adding more complexity to the type chart. Pokemon could carry items. There was a day and night cycle, a real-time internal clock, backwards compatibility, and yeah, a ton of color. Part of the reason it took so long to develop was because of all these new additions. Other than, you know, the fact that, well, they shoved an entire game on four programmers. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I forgot to mention this game was coded by four dudes. One of them being the legendary programmer Satoru Iwata, rest his fucking soul. Iwata actually was a huge lifesaver to the game, as he was able to develop new tools to compress Pokemon's graphic code, which allowed them to add another huge expansion. Literally another game inside the game. I mean, close enough at least. You could return to Kanto in these games and fight all of the original gym leaders and the original Elite Four, which is a pretty damn impressive amount of content for a Game Boy game. This basically made it so you could replay Pokemon Red and Blue in Pokemon Crystal or Gold or Silver. And yeah, these games were pretty successful, selling over 23 million units, making Gold and Silver the third best-selling Pokemon games ever. Sales in Japan alone were insane, and it only snowballed further once the games released in North America in October of 2000 and Europe in 2001. Shit was bonkers. People were going crazy for the Pokemon. <laughs> And now it was time for my favorite Pokemon game of all time, Pokemon Crystal. Pokemon Crystal was released about a year later in Japan on December 14th, 2000, and then North America and Europe followed suit in 2001. It was a pretty cool new entry at the time, with its cool Neo 2000 Suicune box art, which by the way looks a lot cooler in Japanese. The game brought along a bunch of new features, most notably the ability to play as a girl, which I usually play as because she just looks cooler. There were wacky new features too, like a Japan-only mobile phone linking technology. This was called the Mobile System GB, and in the Japanese game, you could use this tech to do some pretty crazy things at the time, like battle and trade through mobile data and access Pokemon news. <laughs> These services would cost real money to use, for example, 10 yen to battle or trade, and 100 yen a month to read the news. This service didn't last very long, though, but I thought I'd bring it up for posterity's sake. Functionally, the game had a lot of changes. New Pokemon could spawn in a lot of different locations, creating for a better spread of Pokemon throughout the game. You still can't catch Hound Hour until post game, which is one of my least favorite aspects of this game to this day. I mean, honestly, if Hound Hour was accessible earlier in the game, I might be willing to move this game to a 10 out of 10, but for now it will stay at a measly 9.99. Lots of locations change, though. The flower shop in Goldenrod is prettier. Trainer locations have been adjusted. The Dragon's Den is more fleshed out. There's a new Battle Tower. Goldenrod's department store has a roof. That's cool. There were a lot of additional aesthetic changes, like updated sprites that actually had some animation when the Pokemon entered the battle. And yeah, yeah, it wasn't that different from gold and silver, but it was different enough that if you were to go back and play one of these games, you might as well play Pokemon Crystal because, you know, it's the definitive version. Unless you want to play the epic remakes. At the time, critics weren't too crazy about this game either, which was pretty typical with third entries in a Pokemon series like Yellow or Emerald. People didn't think it was different enough, and so sales weren't too crazy either, but God damn it, I love this game. I think it's beautiful. Sometimes I just want to stand in a town in the game listening to Junichi Masuda's nostalgic songs and bask in the colorful neon pixelated world of the new millennium's Pokemon. <laughs> Thank you.
Bright work and design is part of the reason this generation is so special to me. Everything is very, very colorful, from the sprites to even the Pokemon designs themselves. Pokemon are bright blue, green, pink, yellow, everything looks like a neon popsicle you'd get out of an ice cream truck. It harkens back to this nostalgic part of my life that, as a kid, I was growing up in. A transition from the colorful 90s to this tech-inspired 2000s. It just felt cool, and it was bending this new age with old, with these larger-than-life buildings with roofs inspired by older Japanese Kansai and Tokai architecture. Generation 2 was heavily inspired by these regions and the giant roofed temples. A lot of traditional Japanese aesthetics bleed through the screen, and it's awesome. And when I look at Ken Sugimori's official art for all the Generation 2 Pokemon, I can officially say this is by far my favorite batch of them. Generation 1 is cool, but often can feel a bit basic because it's foundational. Generation 3 felt a bit generic to me at times. Other generations are often hit or miss, but for me, Generation 2 has one 100 perfect Pokemon. I love every single one of them, and yeah, I've had sex, so you know my opinion matters here. A lot of my favorite designs are from this generation. Scizor, Houndoom, Apom, Kingdra, Wooper, Celebi, Lugia, Entei, Raikou, Suicune, Umbreon, Espeon, I mean, it's unrivaled. Fuck it, I'll take Shuckle over most other generations. I don't care, man, give me a mill tank. I don't give a fuck. The gym leaders have such memorable designs to me, too. I love Edgy Faulkner, Quirky Bugsy, the Sniveling Whitney, the Cool Morty. Not that Morty, you fucking scumbag. Chuck, Jasmine, Price, Claire, Humana, Humana, Awuga, Ice Pop out of head. Goldenrod City, to me alone, is the most iconic town in a Pokemon game ever. The music is nostalgic as hell. In terms of difficulty, the game's about as hard as any mainline Pokemon game really got, in my opinion. I mean, it's not tough. None of the Pokemon games are very hard, they're meant for kids, but it's also not dumbed down as much as modern titles. The levels scale quick and you have to keep up. I mean, hell, this is a game that always gets credited with one of the more annoying gym fights in all of Pokemon. Whitney and her rollout mill tank that'll sweep an entire team if you're not careful. This is truly the Dark Souls of... Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make that joke. This game really makes you feel like a crystal. <laughs> crystal mommies love this shit. They need to release Pokemon Shungite already. Anyway, I love Pokemon Crystal. I love Generation 2, and you should too. I sound like fucking Dr. Seuss. Okay, bye. <laughs>